Hello and welcome to Commodity Culture, where we break down the commodity space for both new and experienced investors. Today we're doing a deep dive into a uranium company, and that is Fission Uranium. Fission Uranium has a market cap of approximately $545 million, trades on the TSX in Canada and the OTCQX in the US. All figures listed in this video will be Canadian dollars unless otherwise stated. Now before we dive in, of course, standard disclaimer, none of this is investment advice. I encourage you to do your own due diligence. These videos are just a starting point for that. And as of the time of this recording, I do not own any shares in Fission Uranium. Fission Uranium is a uranium developer located in Canada's Athabasca Basin, also often referred to as the Saudi Arabia of uranium. We've spoken about this before on the show. The grades of uranium there are incomparable to the rest of the world and they have some of the best deposits there as well. So as we analyze fission uranium, the main thing we're focusing on is their flagship project. I believe it's called PLS and the deposit there is the triple R deposit. So we're going to be breaking that down and the great thing is we have a pre-feasibility study. Now before we dive into the pre-feasibility study numbers, I want to again bring to your attention that uh, it usually, when it comes to an economic assessment of a project, it usually starts or can start with a PEA, a preliminary economic assessment. The next stage is a pre-feasibility study and then a feasibility study, um, which is often called a bankable feasibility study or a full feasibility study as well. Now, as you go from PEA to PFS to FS, you're going to have more and more confidence in those numbers. A PEA is something that you don't want to fully rely on in terms of the economic data. And then a PFS gives you a little more confidence and a full feasibility study will give you more confidence. But that being said, even a full feasibility study is not set in stone. Nothing is until the project gets started. There are so many variables that can change things. Inflation, unforeseen events, black swan events, those happen more often than people believe. Um, there's a number of factors that can change those numbers when the project actually starts getting going. The Triple R deposit has five pods or sections, and only two of them are included in this pre-feasibility study. You might ask why. Well, that's because not a sufficient amount of drilling has yet been done on the other pods to have indicated resources. You cannot base an economic assessment on inferred resources. They need to be at least indicated before you can use them for a PFS. Now, one thing to also keep in mind is these PFS results came out in September of 2019. So it's already been a few years. So these numbers are not yet updated for the inflation we've seen from that time until now. So do bear that in mind. And they are using a $50 base case for the price of uranium. As at the time of this recording, we're hovering around $50 in terms of the spot price. We all believe it's going higher, um, at least those of us who've done our due diligence on the sector. So here we go. The OPEX is $7.18 USD per pound. That is their price to take the uranium out of the ground, which is absolutely absurd, very cheap. Again, that number is going to be a bit higher once we look at the inflation that's occurred since September of 2019, not to mention supply chain issues. Prices are going up for a variety of reasons. The internal rate of return is 25%. This is after tax number and that's good. It's not great compared to some of the other projects we've looked at, but certainly a profitable project. And it has a net present value at an 8% discount rate of $702 million. So the economics for this project are fairly robust. If you want to learn about what internal rate of return and net present value is, there's a number of videos on YouTube that can help you out with that. Um, there is 102.4 million pounds of U308 averaging a grade of 2.1% as indicated resources and 32.8 million pounds of U308 with an average grade of 1.22% as an inferred resource. Um, it has a seven year mine life, but they're looking to extend it to 10 and it can produce approximately or will be able to produce approximately 15 million pounds of uranium annually. Now at a first glance, these numbers in the PFS look robust. Um, I'd like to see a little bit of a higher internal rate of return, especially when we compare it to a lot of other projects out there, but overall good economics and the full feasibility study is set to be filed at the end of this year here in 2022. 
It should be noted that the full feasibility study will contain another pod. As I mentioned, the Triple R deposit has five pods. Only two of them were included in the PFS. Since that time, they've drilled out another pod adequately to be able to find enough uh, indicated resources to then make an economic assessment. So the full feasibility study will take three of the five pods into account. So these numbers will probably get better. They're also planning to start the environmental impact assessment process in 2023, which will likely take a few years. Um, I'm not sure if that's strictly a Canadian thing, but it is something that takes some time. They need to make sure that the impact they're making on the local wildlife, on the environment, and everything like that is going to be as low as possible. So that's just part of the process. As a result, they're then planning to get all necessary permits and start construction of a mine, and this is going to be a traditional underground mine in 2026. They're hoping to produce uranium by 2029 or 2030. Now, although it is a traditional underground mine, this deposit is very near surface. I think it's one of the more near surface deposits in the Athabasca Basin, which means it's going to take less money to bring this mine online because they don't have to dig so deep underground and it's going to be easier to mine the ore. Now aside from the triple R deposit, they do have some exploration potential um, in terms of finding other deposits, finding more uranium, but I don't really think about that at all when I'm assessing them. It really is about the triple R deposit in my opinion. They do have agreements with a number of indigenous First Nations in the area, including the Clearwater River Dene, where they have a capacity and funding agreement. Um, the Buffalo River Dene Nation Engagement and Communication Agreement, and the Athabasca Nations and Communities of the New Henene Capacity and Funding Agreement. These are things that you have to do in Canada and, and in the Athabasca Basin. And I do agree that um, the First Nations need to be respected. A lot of this is going on in and around their official territory. So there's nothing wrong with it. It's a good thing. But it's a thing to keep in mind when you're looking at Canada as a jurisdiction. This is not a hurdle that you will face in a place like Niger, for example. So will they actually produce uranium by 2029 or 2030? I think some people are quite skeptical of that. I'll reserve judgment until I see how things move forward over the next few years. But I think a lot of investors are hoping they're going to be taken out by a bigger player for a juicy premium. Maybe next gen, their properties are very close together and the CEO of Fission has already discussed potentially sharing a mill with next gen and uh, some other synergies that they could work together. So a full takeover by next gen is not impossible. That being said, next gen is also a very nice target, a very attractive takeover target. So who knows, maybe they both get acquired by a bigger player in the space. And a great figure that I love to see, zero debt. Excellent. They also have approximately $38 million worth of cash on the balance sheet. They have no physical uranium, as, as like some of the other companies we've talked about. Not everybody has it. It's great to have if, if you can. I love it because it doesn't get eaten away by inflation. There's a, there's a lot of reasons why I like it. You can watch some of my previous videos to find out why. Um, but I love to see zero debt. So what are the bearish factors for fission? Well, they are a long ways away from production, as I mentioned, although of course we're, we're hoping they get acquired, I think, if you're a shareholder. But that's something to keep in mind. They're not planning to produce, if, if everything goes perfectly smoothly, we're talking 2029, 20, 2030. 20, so they won't produce this cycle, um, unless the cycle lasts a lot longer than people think it will, which is also a possibility. Their location is another issue. They're located in the southwest Athabasca Basin near NextGen's uh, property. And I brought this up when I was talking about NextGen as well. There is very little infrastructure in that area of the Athabasca. So they're going to have to build out a ton of it. And that may be another uh, area where they could collaborate with NextGen in terms of working together to get that going, but that takes time, that takes a tremendous amount of capital, and potentially additional agreements with the First Nations. Low insider ownership, why does this continue to plague us in these uranium videos on these particular companies that I've been doing? Um, the insider ownership is around 0.5%, but they removed it from their investor presentation. Their investor presentation used to say 0.5% management and board for ownership, but they removed it. And I guess the thinking was optically it looked like a bad number. They thought, oh, that doesn't look good. So they just took it out, which seems sneaky because it's almost like they're hoping nobody notices or maybe we'll get investors who don't think about insider ownership, 
Whereas if it was there, an investor who maybe wasn't considering it goes, oh, is that, should I be concerned about that? So I feel like it was a sneaky move to to catch some people. I don't know. Maybe I'm overthinking it. Or maybe they sold everything and the, the amount is now zero. Either way, it's a bad look. The CEO was also interviewed recently on Resource Talks. I recommend you check out that program on YouTube. They talk a lot about uranium. But he was asked about his own lack of purchasing shares because in the past, when the stock was hovering around the 90 cent to $1 range, he had claimed it was undervalued. So at some point after that, it dipped into the 60 cent range. So he was asked, well, if you're saying it was undervalued at, you know, 90 cents to a dollar, why haven't you been loading up when it went down into the 60 cent range? And as we sit here today, it's 83 cents, so still cheaper than that. His answer was not satisfactory. It was basically, well, at least I'm not selling shares. Um, so I'm not here to make judgment. I'll leave that for you. I am just the bearer of information, but do check out that interview. They have what could be called an atrocious share structure. We've talked about share structure before, um, but they've got six, 761 million fully diluted shares outstanding for a company with a market cap of $545 million. Now, compare that to Denison. Denison is known for having a bad share structure. Um, Many people complain about it. Denison has 818 million shares outstanding for a 1 billion market cap. So it's almost double the size. So we can see that Fission's uh, share structure is even worse than Denison. The other problem with this is they might have to further dilute shareholders to get enough capital to advance their project, build the infrastructure, these things we're talking about. And total shares outstanding have grown by 5.4% 4, over the past year, according to Simply Wall Street, and that may continue. I think the CEO was also asked about that in the interview on Resource Talk, so do check that out. His answer, in my opinion, was once again unsatisfactory. So in these videos, I don't give any sort of verdict like buy or sell. I'm personally not a shareholder. You're aware of that already. But the hope is that I can provide enough information to provide a launching pad for your own due diligence and decide for yourself whether this is a company worth investing in. If I missed anything today, please do let me know in the comments below. Uh, or if there's other factors you think I should be looking at um, or anything else about fission you think people should know as well. And if you do appreciate these videos, I would love it if you would like and subscribe, leave a comment. It helps the channel grow. And I'll see you guys next time. Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.